Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Meg Sheehan. I'm coordinator of the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. Welcome to our webinar series in which we have featured activists and experts exposing the myth that Mega Dam hydropower is clean and green renewable electricity. This is the third in our three part series. And tonight's topic is why hydroelectricity is a false solution to the climate change, to climate change. We'll be recording the webinar and it will be available on Facebook. We're live streaming on Facebook and we'll be sending out a link to the recorded Zoom webinar as soon as it's available. NAMRA's mission is to protect rivers and their communities by resisting mega dams and their transmission corridors. We have three things that we work on, debunking the myth that high Canadian hydropower is clean and renewable. We work on shutting down markets for dirty Canadian hydropower by stopping transmission corridors to the US. And we prom promote alternatives to fossil fuels and mega dams, such as conservation and efficiency. Our current campaigns include the following. In Canada, we're working to oppose mega dams on the East Coast and Eastern Canada and Atlantic Canada. We're working with our allies on the Churchill, Moustachipa River, including the Grand River Keeper Labrador and the Labrador Land Protectors to oppose Nalcor Energy's new Muskrat Falls Dam that is almost built and to raise awareness about the impacts of that. And we're working to oppose the proposed Gull Island Dam, which will be even bigger than Muskrat Falls on the Churchill River. In Central Canada, we're working with allies um, and hydro impacted communities in the Manitoba region. There's a new dam being built by Manitoba Hydro, the PS Dam, and there are 10 more dams that are planned and recently announced. On the West Coast, we're working with allies who are opposing the Site C Dam in British Columbia, a massive disaster that you've probably heard about on some of our prior webinars. As far as transmission corridors and exporting this electricity to Canada, we, we have active campaigns in New York where we're opposing the Champlain Hudson Power Express with many, many allies, including just climate justice groups, the Hudson River Keeper and others. In Maine, we are opposing the, the New England Clean Energy Connect and also the CMP, called the CMP corridor, which will export Canadian hydropower to Boston via Maine. And Vermont, we're keeping an eye on the New England Clean Energy Connect, which is seen as an alternative to the main corridor. If that somehow is stopped in Maine, we believe that the energy companies will pivot over to Vermont and go with TDI Blackstone's New England Clean Energy Link to Boston. In New York, we're keeping an eye on the Erie Connector, something that just uh, surfaced recently in connection with President Biden's infrastructure plan, we believe. And in Eastern Canada, we're keeping an eye on the Atlantic Loop. Tonight's program features three speakers. We have Gary Walkner from Save the World's Rivers, Roger Wheeler from Friends of Sebago Lake in Maine, and Ananda Litan, a worldwide globally renowned activist and friend of our movement. With no further ado, I'll turn it over to Gary. Okay, thank you, Meg. Welcome. I'm trying to do just sound and video check. The screen share working okay, and you can all hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. My name is Gary Walkner. I live in Colorado. Um, I uh, work very hard to protect, protect rivers in the southwest United States and also have traveled around the world quite a bit working to protect rivers. 
Um, one of my specialties is talking about the myth of clean hydropower, how dams and reservoirs emit greenhouse gases and make climate change worse. And this issue kind of got mainstreamed back in 2015, 2016, started seeing a lot of articles about it in the national press here in the United States and a little bit internationally. Here's one in the Washington Post uh, that uh, highlighted this issue. Um, dams create many problems and you know, we all know about these the dams block rivers, they slow rivers, they almost always make water quality worse, they cause fish extinctions, they displace people and cause human rights violations, they're expensive, they sometimes make flooding worse, they exacerbate coastal flooding, beach erosion, and sea level rise, and in the tropical areas they actually increase disease in humans. And so there's all sorts of really good reasons to despise dams, and I'm a dam despiser. Um, in addition, uh, I've gotten very involved in the uh, dams creating greenhouse gas emissions issue. So uh, the science around this issue of, about how dams and reservoirs um, create methane and exacerbate climate change started about 30 years ago, uh, kind of spearheaded by a, a professor named Dr. Philip Burnside, who's based in Brazil, is still down there. He's an IPCC scientist um, with the International Panel for Climate Change. And he basically discovered the idea that, methanes, that methane um, was being produced by hydropower dams. And since that time, uh, there's been numerous studies done by the US EPA, the US Army Corps of Engineers, dozens of international university research scientists, it was actually embedded in the 2006 Kyoto Protocol, although you probably never hear about it. Uh, the IPCC scientists did that. And the US uh, National Science Foundation has also done studies. Um, I've written about it extensively. I used to write for EcoWatch quite a bit. And Climate Central down here in the left-hand corner uh, had articles about it too. There are really two main ways that dams create greenhouse gas emissions. And the first one is deforestation. As we know, forests sequester carbon, and there have been estimates that millions of acres uh, of forests have been cleared around the world for hydropower, plant, hydropower plants. These forests do not regrow and are flooded. Um, and in, in just one study in Brazil, a very recent study, two hydropower plants were estimated to uh, cause 90,000 acres of deforestation. So all the carbon that's sequestered in these forests is gone and the forests never regrow. And it's a consequential uh, increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, the ability for forests to sequester carbon. The second one is a, is a little more in the weeds and I'll just kind of go through this slide a little bit slowly. And this is really kind of the big issue where the rubber hits the road. Dams and reservoirs create greenhouse gas emissions. They also uh, create methane and carbon dioxide. And so uh, what really happens here is that uh, reservoirs um, have organic matter flowing into them. And when organic matter decomposes underwater, it's called anaerobic decomposition. And methane is the byproduct of that. And so whenever uh, sediment runs into a reservoir that has um, uh, organic matter into it, decaying plant matter, for example, leaves, uh, you, you see dramatically more leaf litter in reservoirs than you would in a normal uh, healthy stream. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why they create methane and you get this decomposition is that reservoirs go up and down, of course, through the hydropower ramping cycle. Often that's very seasonal. And so when the water goes down, an uh, entire ring of a reservoir will grow plants on it. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll grow significant vegetation. And then when the reservoir is raised back up, all that, all that vegetation is drowned and it causes um, all this vegetation and organic matter to decompose anaerobically and it releases methane. So it's a significant contributor to methane, um, to climate change. And I'll get into some of the, the examples in the next slide of how uh, some reservoirs are, are worse than others. So there's a lot of words here, um, but <clears throat> the bigger the dam and reservoir, uh, the more um, methane and, and carbon dioxide it creates. The, when the weather is warmer and wetter, you also get uh, an increase in GHG emissions. 
the initial flooding of the landscape, if, if it involves a large area um, where the vegetation is flooded, that causes increased um, uh, GHG emissions. The more vegetation and sediment that runs off into a reservoir, um, if a reservoir goes up and down a lot on a season or a hydropower, hydropower ramping cycle, it creates more methane emissions. Um, newer uh, reservoirs create more than older ones. If a reservoir is near an agricultural area, which this happens a lot, especially here in the United States, where fertilizer heavy water and erosion is flowing into the reservoir, that um, uh, feeds the biological cycle, which makes methane um, created more. And where any kind of heavy nutrient load is pouring into a reservoir, including from direct human waste, stormwater runoff, or wastewater treatment plants. Big, flat, warm reservoirs in tropical countries are the worst. But uh, if you're in Canada, just wait. Uh, it's not good in some places there either. So there's thousands of hydropower dams under construction across the planet and tens of thousands planned. Um, they all create some level of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, including traditional and run of the river projects. It also is not just hydropower, it's any reservoir that is created for flood control, water supply, which is very common here in the United States, as well as recreation. Um, they all create some level of greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm gonna slow down just a little bit on this slide and kind of talk you through it. The 2008 estimate is a source out of International Rivers. You're probably familiar with that organization. And they did some estimates of the um, amount of, uh, it's called CO2 equivalent or greenhouse gas equivalent of a reservoir. Um, Tropical reservoirs are the worst. They can be actually two or three times worse than a coal-fired natural power plant that's creating the same amount of electricity. So a hydropower plant in the tropics can actually create dramatically more um, greenhouse gas emissions than coal or, or natural gas. Run of the rivers uh, ones there again on the left can also create natural um, greenhouse gas emissions and boreal forests, uh, boreal reservoirs too. And this is a 2008 estimate. Uh, in, the, in the years between there, in 2016, a significant study came out that um, kind of refined some of the estimates. And these are um, um, uh, errors of margin on, on, errors of margin on these um, estimates in the, in the 2016 estimate. The red dot right here is the median for all hydropower. And again, this is um, uh, electricity sources from coal, either lignite coal or hard coal, natural gas, oil. Hydropower is this one, it has a big um, uh, error uh, bar with it. Solar energy, biomass, wind, nuclear power. It's important to know that there is no free lunch when it comes to creating electricity. There are uh, GHG emissions associated with everything, but um, uh, obviously coal generally is the worst. Power plants all range in terms of how they're operated, uh, and, but GHG emissions definitely come from hydropower plants and sometimes it's very significant. The study out of Climate Central said those researchers suggest all large reservoirs globally could emit up to 104 teragrams of methane annually. By comparison, NASA estimates the global methane emissions associated with burning fossil fuels totals between 80 and 100 ter 120 teragrams annually. So um, reservoir emissions can equal that of fossil fuels. Emissions are not being counted. As I mentioned earlier, the Kyoto Protocol in 2006 and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change actually created a methane emissions guideline for flooded lands, including hydropower. However, no country is currently reporting the emissions. Uh, the intended nationally determined contributions that every country put in after COP21, um, where they were supposed to report emissions, nobody is doing it. Um, the, the IPCC protocol is being considered, <clears throat> but is facing extreme pressure from big hydro. This is going on all over the world, including here in the United States. The US Department of Energy is considering uh, hundreds of new hydropower projects and actually created a map of where you could do it here in the United States. This is from a 2014 um, study by the US Department of Energy. I've had a uh, great opportunity to travel around the world um, here on the Mekong River, 
There's a dramatic number of dams proposed on the Mekong River, and this would be a very, very bad place to do hydropower because it is warm and it is very wet, and the reservoirs are usually very large on the Mekong River, and they would create dramatic amounts of hydro uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Also been down the Marinon River uh, in Peru. Um, this is the headwaters of the Amazon, the biggest tributary of the Amazon. Uh, all these proposed dams are on the Medellin River. This is the Amazon River out here. Um, uh, when you're up in the colder, uh, uh, higher elevation sections, the greenhouse gas emissions wouldn't be as bad, but when you get down into the jungle area, close to the Amazon, you would definitely get extraordinary um, greenhouse gas emissions. So um, there was a study that came out, as I mentioned, in 2016, and it actually did estimates, and I'll get to the estimates for Canada here in a minute, of hydropower and reservoir dams all over the world, um, including on the Colorado River, which is a place I do some work. Again, this is the same graph we saw a few minutes ago. Here's the median for all hydropower. This is actually Glen Canyon Dam and Lake Powell on the Colorado River. And of course, this is Hoover Dam, uh, which is the biggest reservoir in the United States uh, that creates Lake Mead. And it is actually as bad as a coal-fired power plant in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions it creates. You never hear about it. Nobody talks about it. I've written about it extensively. Everyone ignores it. So here we are in Canada. Um, that same study also did predictions or estimates of greenhouse gas emissions from a few reservoirs in Canada. The data table is here on the left and the graph is on the right. Um, the Churchill Falls, which some of you are familiar with, um, Dam and Reservoir System is at the higher end of the, the sort of margin of error for hydropower dams, not quite as bad, or about and the lower end of natural gas in terms of emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then of course the big one is the biggest reservoir in Quebec. Uh, Canyon Pisco. Did I say that right? Close. Canyon Pisco Reservoir, which is actually about double the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of a coal-fired burning power plant that puts out the same amount of electricity. So again, this is a huge body of water. As you know, it's the biggest body of uh, fresh water in, in uh, Quebec. Um, and it is a dramatic emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, especially methane. This is the table out of a study by Professor Bradford Hager at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he synthesized this 2016 study and several other studies and created, um, we're looking at this column in the table right here. So if you know some of these reservoir and hydropower complexes, here's the Canyon Pisco down here at the bottom. Um, here's Churchill Falls up here at 436 uh, in terms of its um, CO2 equivalent. So even reservoirs in northerly climates can have dramatic greenhouse gas emissions. Real, and I'll kind of go through these a little quicker. Um, five things you can do to fight the myth of clean hydro and protect rivers. Number one is a, uh, address the greenwashing by the hydropower industry. Um, uh, allegations of what Hydro Quebec do are dramatic. They uh, put out their own sort of fake science. They also are known to have um, climate scientists have told me um, a uh, improper relationship with the inter -panel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change influencing the research there and the study that comes out. So, um, you know, dealing with the greenwashing of the hydro industry, of course, is big. It also happens at elected and governmental levels. It happens by the big banks. It happens by environmental groups. On the right, you'll see the Nature Conservancy, unfortunately, is one of the greenwashing organizations that promotes hydropower. And there are others too, and Curl, the World Wildlife Fund are probably the two biggest. Um, I sometimes speak out against them. I think we have to do that. Um, and also support and encourage efforts to calculate and uh, count emissions. You know, in my local watershed in Fort Collins, Colorado, the Platte River Power Authority is a, it gets electricity from Glen Canyon Dam. And they say point blank, it's emissions-free resource. That is what I call 
false information. It is not emissions free. So you got to put pressure on all of these uh, agencies and power producers to um, calculate and count the emissions. Also alternatives, again, there's no free lunch uh, when it comes to electricity um, generation. Um, solar power is probably one of the better, although it has problems too in terms of um, batteries and lithium mining and whatnot, but it tends to be better. It's also getting cheaper faster than anything. Um, so promoting alternatives is a great idea. And then support organizations and colleagues who are fighting dams across the planet. Um, International Rivers do, does good work. Bank Watch there's a, there's a, um, does good work. In Eastern Europe, there's an organization called BalkanRivers.net. They good work. Uh, we've launched a program called SaveTheWorldRivers.org. Of course, NAMR does good work, Dam Watch International, and some of the Mekong River groups do good work. Um, and I'm going to just make a picture. I, and this is my last slide. I encourage people to get online, especially on Twitter. Twitter hasn't yet uh, restricted who sees um, your content. So I encourage people to get on Twitter, share work, share successes, uh, share problems so that we can connect across the planet. Use the hashtags, the damn truth and dirty hydro so we can all look at the same hashtags and see what everyone's doing. That's the end of my presentation. I've greatly enjoyed talking to you all. I'm gonna turn it back over to May. Great, thanks so much, Gary. Really exciting and thanks for that synthesis of all that information. Our next speaker is Roger Wheeler. <clears throat> Let's see, I uh, better go to the top here. Okay. Um, there. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, the late uh, oceanographer Hans Noy and uh, the book Blue Deserts by Steve Kasperzak for teaching us how the uh, these mega dams uh, are hoarding life-sustaining spring runoffs and they're uh, warming our regional climates and even global climates and they're doing great damage to the uh, marine marine fisheries. Um, Hans Noy's uh, 1964 Gulf of St. Lawrence unpublished study is the foundation of how Blue Desert exposes to what degree mega dams rob the ocean of, uh, let me get, uh, of the energy by hoarding the spring freshet. They release climate changing heat pollution and they devastate marine fisheries. Um, the, this uh, is a cover of this uh, 1970s uh, abbreviated version. It's kind of eyebrow raising that the version, uh, this abbreviated version of Noy's 64 unpublished study was quietly re released after Manicougan River's Manic 5 Dam was completed. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, let me go back to. Here's a uh, aerial of where the study took place. Uh, it's a it was a study of the, the flow of fresh water and the salt water in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and uh, it never been done before. And uh, they were really looking at uh, how ice formed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and sort of was this data was collected kind of by accident as a sideline to the, the ice study. But uh, um, you can see where the Manicougan River estuary is and the uh, circle, white circle there is the Manic 5 Reservoir now, which is uh, flooded by the, the dam, one of the larger reservoirs in the world. It was from this study, uh, I guess Hans Noy kind of had a uh, Houston, we have a problem moment, um, especially uh, regarding spaceship Earth, because uh, he recognized that how these dams could in fact impact so many aspects of uh, heat and uh, ocean currents. Uh, just, uh, just to get you a, a visual of the size, this is the Manic 5, Manic uh, Coogan River Dam. Um, it's one of the largest arch dams in the world. You can see on the right, the uh, reservoir is a filled in meteor, huge meteor crater. Um, and uh, bottom left is the an old photo of the free flowing Manicougan River. Uh, it wasn't the largest river, uh, but the, for the dams in about a few days, water could flow from the mountains to the 
Gulf, all the way to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And, but now thanks to cascading uh, mega dams, the water takes about eight years to fully circulate down the same distance. The uh, thermal regime and the chemistry of the fresh water entering the Gulf of St. Lawrence are greatly altered by this stagnation as they are all in all mega dam reservoirs. Um, just so you have a comparison of flow here, um, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, picture about 1931, uh, uh, has an average annual flow of 85,000 cubic feet per second. That's a good sized river there. Uh, so just keep that in mind when I compare it to, to other flows. Um, this uh, graph by uh, Hans Noy um, gives us a comparison of the natural spring pulse uh, that used to exist on the Manicougan versus the uh, regulated flow. You can see that the uh, spring pulse there uh, peaks in May. Uh, it, uh, it's about equal to one and a half times the Niagara Falls average flow. Notice the uh, dark solid line. That's the the regulated flow now. Instead of uh, no, almost no flow in the winter, uh, most of the flow now occurs in the winter and hardly any flow, uh, a lot less flow occurs in uh, the spring and into the summer. It's a, it's a huge change. Uh, now, this is a map of the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, the Laurentian Channel flowing out into the Atlantic Ocean. The blue arrows represent fresh water going out. Um, and uh, just because of physics, uh, it, it kind of uh, forces salt water comes in. And uh, you'll notice the fresh water continues on down the, the flow, the low salinity water all the way to the Gulf of Maine and even to the mid Atlantic bite off of Massachusetts. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, the uh, red arrows representing salt water are bigger. Well, that's because the most important thing you can remember about this slide is that Noy calculated uh, at Point St. Des Moines, uh, uh, one to 15 volume ratio of freshwater outflow to salt water inflow. Um, I mean, this is further up in the estuary there. Um, that's, a, that's a big difference. So. The fresh water flow, the amount of it affects, greatly affects or exponentially affects the volume of salt water flow coming in. Um, you'll notice the, the purple arrows, of course, are the, um, the Labrador current. And it has a lot of uh, low salinity water, thanks to all the rivers. But it too, there's a lot of dams in uh, Hud James Bay and Hudson Bay, Northern Quebec, Labrador, Newfoundland that uh, affect uh, that affect the flow of the uh, fresh water and the timing of the pulses. So uh, this, this area is a focal point of freshwater flow, yet it's been very compromised by uh, the uh, changes in the, by, made by the dams. Um, just uh, so you take away from this what a salt wedge estuary two-way flow looks like. Here's a cross section at Point de Monts. You know, that's just up from the Manicougan River comes in. Uh, the blue is the fresh water. It's going a lot faster, but a whole lot more salt water is coming in. It's, it's going slower, except when it hits uh, underwater hills or obstructions and uh, shallow water, it, uh, it causes upwellings and it, uh, it brings nutrients to the surface. And it's a huge impact for the, uh, for the ecosystem. Now, keep in mind, the St. Lawrence uh, River's regulated now, the Sanguinet. And uh, on the last presentation, there was a bunch of other rivers that mentioned that uh, have been regulated in the uh, St. Lawrence region. So this ratio um, doesn't exist. And certainly the ratio out by the Gas Bay Current and the, where it, the Laurentian Channel does not exist anymore. Um, another sketch by Hans Noy. Um, just uh, you have uh, cascading mega dams, uh, and uh, you see the large one there. The uh, large block of red is the Manic Five Reservoir. The medium, 
meteor crater. Uh, this, this dam is storing the equivalency of uh, 27 Moosehead Lakes. This water is heated all summer. It's uh, then the, all, that and the other dams, it's released in the winter, taking all the heat with it. Plus it's releasing heat to the atmosphere. And it doesn't seem to have uh, <laughs> uh, you know, much attention uh, in the scientific community. Uh, the impacts, uh, this impacts the two-way flow ratio in the Gulf of Maine. So uh, just remember that that ratio and the two-way flow is an important uh, concept to understand. Uh, let's see. Oh, somebody's, I'm not being able to move my screen. <laughs> is, there a, is there a reason for that? Hello? Hey, Roger. Um, yeah. You just try to click in the middle and try to click back on or try to use the arrow keys. There you oh, okay. okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, there it goes. Um, you know, in the sort of worldwide in the Arctic, uh, there's been a gradual increase in uh, these mega dams, but especially it occurred in the three decades around uh, the 1970 to the to the 1990s. Um, just uh, was a <laughs> let's say a mega building of them. Um, but you notice in the 1990s, uh, kind of. It's when all everything bad started to happen, the, the accelerated uh, permafrost problems, the accelerating the sea ice melting, um, the uh, climate, just, you know, these hot spots occurred, especially in the northern regions of the earth. Uh, the, and of course, in 1990s, the, the fisheries went uh, belly up, in, especially in the North Atlantic. Um, so we, we want to see some big reservoirs. We can go to Russia. Um, these, uh, these are more, most of them are in central Russia. The uh, Colma, of course, is in the eastern edge. Um, each of these Russian dams produce about eight to 10 times the megawatts of all the hydro dams in Maine combined. Um, there's a lot of uh, storage here of spring freshets. There's a lot of heat being uh, and generated in the atmosphere and downriver. In fact, these, these dams don't work unless you have heat. In, in, in 40 below zero, you've, you've got to have uh, warmed water uh, from huge reservoirs, these huge heat sinks. Um, let's, you look at the Yenisei, the, and the Ob, two Mississippi sized rivers um, flowing into the Kara Sea of the Arctic Ocean. Um, there's a lot of mega dams on these rivers. Uh, the pulse energy, in the conservative estimate now, and the, and the volume. Of 26 to 38 Niagara Falls uh, are lost in the spring freshet coming into the Kara Sea. Of course, they're stored and then dumped in the winter, as never happened in geologic history uh, when, when the Arctic's been formed. Um, has anyone ever noticed anything wrong? Well, uh, in Miami Herald in 1975, uh, there was an article about that. Um, you know, basically what it said is uh, these dams were created inland oceans, which accounted for more humidity, more rain, less seasonal fluctuation in temperature, and more frequent change in the weather. The Brass Dam and others like it along the Angara have warmed up central Siberia by at least 10 degrees in the past 10 years. Uh, said the Siberians are getting concerned about this. Uh, one official of a Siberian city, I've talked to a reporter who wrote one of these stories said uh, they never used names because they didn't want these people to end up in a gulag. But this official said, we used to have winter temperatures as low as minus 67 degrees here. Now it's a rare day on which the thermometer drops to 40 below zero. And this happened rapidly right after the dams were built. Um, there was, uh, going back to the marine fisheries, um, because that's one of the points I wanted to make. Uh, there were a lot of warnings about it. And, Hans Noy led, led, uh, led the warnings. Um, you know, he was a proponent that stagnancy is the most polluting condition of nature. And uh, he, he was worried about the, uh, the fish. Um, the one statement he made really strikes me. It is, it is therefore not unreasonable to presume that large scale changes have already been inflicted on the marine life of the Atlantic region of Canada and may even have adversely affected the fish stocks of the entire Western North Atlantic. This was in 1976. Um, 
in uh, the, the late Michael Rosenger, a leading Russian expert, who became a United States citizen, he had to leave or he would have been thrown in a gulag, uh, sort of explained you know, what was happening, uh, these dams were doing. And his big thing was that if you cross certain thresholds, like if a permanent 50 to 75% reduction in spring flow of a river is catastrophic to the marine uh, fisheries uh, that that river affects. Um, and it can be many hundreds of miles from that river. Simon Prinsenberg, a Canadian oceanographer, spent eight years studying Hudson Bay, uh, managed a, a, a small warning, said uh, that these mega dams could have effects as far away as the Labrador coast, significantly reducing cod catches. Now, mega dams are the enemy of marine diatoms. Diatoms are the most important foundation of the marine food chain and are one of nature's most powerful biological cooling mechanisms for global climate. Their shells are heavy, they're made of silica and they sink to the bottom and uh, a, good, a per good percentage is uh, permanently sequestered in the ocean bottom. It's bye-bye to the carbon and the carbon dioxide. Uh, dams and flow regulation uh, have diminished diatom populations by disrupting the volume and timing of the delivery of nutrients, alter the coastal water temperature and salinity. They dampen upwelling current energy and reduce mixing of surface layers, which result in increased stratification. And diatoms do not like stratification. They thrive in mixed nutrient-rich uh, oceans. Non-diatom phytoplankton dominate when ocean layers are stratified. A NASA study says that diatom populations in a 14 year period since 1998 have been falling 1% per year. Surprise, surprise. Um, many species of the marine ecosystem have for millennia adapted their feeding, reproductive and larval growth cycles to that annual strong spring freshet flow poles. Um, the extermination of this spring freshet by these mega dams and the flow regulation has been ignored in the discussion about the cause of the present demise of the marine fishery. One copepod, Calanus finmarchicus, is extremely important in the Northwest Atlantic here. And a lot of species uh, you know, depend on it. One is especially the young of the cod, the cod nopli, they, uh, they require it. Uh, the northern right whale, uh, this is one of their primary food sources. And uh, the, the changes in the spring pulses uh, have an impact on this uh, Calanus, Cal I'm sorry, Calanus finmarchicus. Uh, it's one of the things that really should be looked at instead of saying it's all because of uh, global warming. Uh, the uh, these graphs of cod here. Um, the east coast of Newfoundland, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Gulf of Maine are all shown here. The cod populations all crashed in a short time frame after 1990. Well, just as Hans Noe was explaining, it would happen. Um, the, you know, the, uh, you can have all the moratoriums on fishing, but uh, it doesn't do any good if you, you have these mega dams with their flow regulation starving in uh, the, 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 the fishery and also changing their, uh, what they've adapted to for their reproductive cycles. Um, so I like to, you know, hydropower clean and renewable. Well, in summary, you know, you, you look at what it's done, um, well, you can judge for yourself. Like I can say it's, it's flatlined the spring flood pulse. Um, it's, it's exterminated the natural seasonal hydrological cycle order. Um, it's generated uh, heat pollution, caused climate change. It's reduced nutrient delivering coastal upwelling energy. Um, it's altered the critical timing of nutrient flow. It's, uh, it's reduced the competitive advantage of diatom phytoplankton. It's uh, eliminated natural cooling mechanisms. Um, that you know help maintain uh, <laughs> uh, dynamic climate equilibrium. It's uh, reduced spring freshet forces and 
weakened uh, Arctic and Atlantic Ocean currents. It's reduced Arctic sea ice with its heat pollution. Um, it's, uh, that's uh, accelerated the melting of the polar ice cap, uh, which is causing sea level accelerated sea level rise, which is further stressing or will stress uh, social and economic world order. Uh, doesn't sound like you take what's happening up upriver. We, we're just in the last presentation for those things, and you add uh, what's happening out downriver. It's a slam dunk that uh, these mega dams are not clean and renewable. And I just posted some uh, websites and where you can get more information uh, here and uh, references and stuff. So that, that about does it. I hope I didn't go over too much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. That was extremely informative, lots of science, and I highly recommend reading the book. It's very readable and it has lots of great talking points in it for spreading the message as Gary suggested we do. And so our next speaker, Ananda Litan, will talk about efforts to get out the word that hydropower, hydroelectricity, is one of the false solutions to the climate crisis. So I'll turn it over to Ananda. Thanks, Meg. And uh, much thanks to uh, Gary and Roger for really elaborately laying out why hydropower can never constitute a real renewable energy source and reasons why we should be uh, really fighting all the greenwashing that's happening across uh, around the world currently. Uh, ways in which uh, the hydropower industry is seeking subsidies and financing, uh, and positing itself as a renewable energy source. Uh, before I get into uh, what I've been asked to speak about, which is a new publication uh, called Hoodwinked in the Hot House, which, uh, which is basically a popular education zine uh, written by a, a over two dozen different organizations collaborated on this over the last eight months to help us fight a variety of false solutions. I just want to share that... Uh, Meg and I know each other. I've known Meg for at least, you know, well over a decade. And I actually remember the first time I met Meg, we were both in DC at a time when the Obama administration was trying to pass the first federal uh, uh, climate legislation. And uh, under, I think it was ca called the uh, Climate and Clean Energy Act or the ACES bill, whatever, the Waxman Markey Cap and Trade Bill. What's uh, significant about that is that Meg and I were part of a small delegation there to, to actually belabor this point that a lot of what was contained in that bill, um, and it was kind of an omnibus bill, it had multiple facets, but at the center of it, they were providing massive subsidies as renewable energy subsidies to not just hydropower, but biomass incineration, a waste incineration, bridge fuels that are like fracked gas and alternatives to coal, clean coal, nuclear power, and a whole host of problematic energy sources that are harming people and planet. So we were part of a small delegation there, not only to let senators and Congress uh, people know uh, that these were not re re real renewable energy sources, uh, and that uh, these were energy sources that were already getting loads, billions of dollars of subsidies, that uh, by further subsidizing them through this legislation, they would be creating basically barriers to the advancement of any clean energy future that we could envision or any real meaningful effort to tackle, tackle climate change. Um, what's more egregious is actually uh, once we dug into the details and found out the various ways that the bill really propped up the subsidies. And, uh, and I wanted to kind of leave it there to say that uh, I really appreciate you all have, uh, hosting this, uh, this webinar because if, if, if there's one thing we could do, even uh, in terms of the future state of the planet, in terms of tackling the climate crisis, is it, I think we could all look at how we could advance and expand our efforts to really tackle these climate false solutions that are being advanced, that are really being not only uh, uh, seek to uh, disrupt the waterways and the function of water in the broader ecological cycle and all the ways that uh, uh, Roger laid out, but, but also really make it impossible for future generations to really um, survive the various shocks and slides, the storms, the floods, the fires, the droughts, the economic impacts of uh, this global ecological crisis. And so back to this uh, hoodwinked in the hothouse, this was actually uh, came about around the same time that Meg and I met because a number of, uh, for the last two decades, there have been 
a number of activists who have been reeling against these false solutions. And these are primarily being people on the front lines of the impacts, indigenous communities, rural communities, poor communities, black, brown, and migrant communities that have been the first and most hit by the impacts of these false solutions, whether it was on the front end of uranium mining uh, to supply the nuclear power industry, or on the, on the tail end of that cradle to grave cycle, where the nuclear waste, uh, radioactive waste is being dumped in a lot of these people's backyards. They've been on the front end of a lot of the, of the, um, the land that has been stolen from indigenous nations to, uh, to clear and turn into massive hydro projects. They've been at the front, uh, they've been really at the front end, the community is first and most impacted by both fossil fuel extraction, but also then the various myriad of ways in which the fossil fuel, petrochemical and other industries choose to dispose of their waste and, uh, and deal with, uh, you know, the externalized costs of uh, their operations. Now, hoodwinked in the hothouse uh, really was a reflection of the struggles of thousands of communities. We came together about 15 years ago, um, it was an organized grassroots uh, network called Rising Tide North America that really brought us together to say, hey, let's unite a lot of these grassroots groups that don't have the funding, that don't have the voice at national platforms and have to take on some of these big uh, multinational environmental groups. Because the other thing I forgot to mention is when Meg and I were in DC, we discovered that a big hurdle for us was not just tackling these industries, but that there was a layer, a whole cadre of, uh, and, uh, and both uh, uh, my previous uh, uh, two uh, panelists uh, mentioned this, that there's a whole cadre of large international environmental NGOs that are actually promoting these as solutions that are getting billions of dollars being paid out by what I call philanthropic capitalists like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and uh, uh, people who are claiming to be captains of industry and promoting these solutions to lawmakers, both internationally, but also at the UN. In fact, uh, the scale of this problem is so big. I, I usually say these days about the Paris Accord, the Paris Accord is essentially a trade agreement that has been brokered uh, and influenced by some of these large vested interests uh, all the, you know, both the energy capitalists, but also philanthropic capitalists to, to carve out pathways or strategies for tackling climate change that do not actually look at the whole picture. So Hoodwink to the Hot House, this was the third edition. Uh, we put out the first edition, uh, the second edition in 2009 in the lead up to the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009, where a lot of our grassroots forces rallied around this idea that we needed an alternative voice that really looked at real solutions, solutions led by communities and workers, not led by scientists in the pockets of industry, not led by philanthropic capitalists who think they can broker closed door deals with industry and government to, uh, to come up with their very elite ideas around climate strategy, but communities first and most impacted people whose voices need to be at every table where, where issues like climate change are being discussed. Uh, we just, after an eight month uh, collaboration, we uh, produced uh, this booklet. It covers everything from hydroelectricity, biomass, waste incineration. And just to point, even in some of the first slides uh, in terms of the energy mix, uh, I'm sure Meg noticed this, that biomass was way down. In fact, biomass, uh, it is now an established fact, produces 150, uh, it's 150% more carbon intensive than coal. Waste burning is about 200 or twice as carbon intensive as coal. So a lot of the figures we come across, uh, we have to really apply a critical lens to examining and look at wh wh where are the, uh, the industry accountants hiding the emissions, hiding the numbers or skewing the numbers. Because at the end of the day, uh, that's what a lot of these folks do. It's sad to admit, but a large number of the scientific cadre, even while we hold up the importance of science-led solutions, we have to recognize that a large part of science, like religion, is still in the pockets of the elite who are destroying this planet. Uh, so back to Hoodwinked. Uh, Hoodwinked was an eight-month collaboration. We just came out with its release. You should all check it out. The, uh, the website is climatefalsesolutions.org, and I can uh, put it here in the chat for folks who want to look at it right away. But it covers not only uh, very succinct uh, uh, the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance provided a very clear, succinct paragraph on hydroelectricity that you can see the slide here. But uh, groups fighting biomass incinerators provided uh, chapters on biomass and how they're being posited on a wider uh, host of uh, solutions that are being posited as nature-based solutions to promote so-called green, like a real 
you know, sophisticated greenwashing agenda that is now being advanced uh, to burn, to, to, to gain carbon credits for burning waste and woody biomass. And, and currently there are forests in our part of uh, the lands here and the lands of the Slave Tooth, the Squamish and the Muskium and beyond in the Pacific Northwest, where old growth forests are being logged to ship the wood out to burn in biomass incinerators in Europe and China and to replace coal. So the scale of false solutions is enormous. Nuclear power is included in here. Then a whole host of what I call neoliberal policy scams. Because alongside the techno fixes, there's also policy scams like carbon trading, forest car conservation offsets, nature-based solutions. And these are all neoliberal policy schemes. For those of you who are familiar, I won't get into, uh, I think, I think uh, a, a full workshop on the nature of carbon trading and offsets uh, merits uh, some uh, attention by every act act activist group. But all I, I, can, I will say is that these are mechanisms that are created around the world, including at the UN. The first one was called the Clean Development Mechanism developed on the, the Kyoto Pro Protocol. But these are all policy mechanisms aimed to funnel money at what are declared renewable energy uh, development pathways, but in fact are huge subsidies for these industries, both fossil fuel industries, but also these false solution sectors. Uh, and it's closely linked to, to really understand how these subsidies are, are propping up the hydropower industry, the coal industry, the biomass industry, nuclear industry, and a whole host of other industries uh, it's worthwhile understanding the dynamics between carbon pricing uh, and both in Canada and the US, there's, there's over uh, two dozen, I think, different schemes right now being advanced at state and federal levels and provincial levels uh, that are some form of carbon pricing mechanisms. But they're basically neoliberal policy pathways to maintain the status quo, minimize the profit impacts on these uh, big destructive corporations, and really keep money from where the real solutions rubber hits the road, where we really need to be leaning into uh, rapid uh, decarbonization. I will close off because I think my time is nearly up by reading one paragraph because uh, it's uh, worthwhile uh, having a look at this uh, this climate false solutions booklet that we've produced. It's been produced as a popular education zine. Feel free to use it. I think it's been most effective. When we introduced it at the Copenhagen Climate Co uh, COP over 12 years ago, it's probably been the most, it was probably the most effective tool we could use to push big greens away from some of these false solutions. We still have a long ways to go. Hydro is going to be one of the most difficult ones because water, it's still counterintuitive to a lot of the big green thinking. To, to, they, they, they have just kind of carte blanche kept put wind, water, solar all in the same bucket as opposed to fossil fuels. And so a lot of what you all have highlighted as the reasons why hydro shouldn't be renewable are education points you should definitely press the big greens on, especially the ones that are conservation oriented. But, uh, but furthermore, I, what we really need to do is question the assumptions amongst grassroots groups themselves. Because even youth mobilizations like Extinction Rebellion and Sunrise and a lot of the direct action formations that I work with oftentimes get sold the bill of goods on these solutions. Net zero emissions, if there's one subsidy threat to hydroelectricity and all these false solutions, it's the premise that net zero emissions, that industry should be allowed to define their own strategic pathways. That's what net zero emissions is. Net zero emissions is essentially finding alternative pathways to actually reducing uh, emissions at source. Uh, you can research it more, it's in this booklet. Uh, I'll close with uh, the opening two paragraphs of uh, Hoodwinked in the Hot House. In the past decade, since the last edition of this booklet, we have seen a massive increase in activism to tackle the climate crisis, indigenous people's resistance to destructive industrial projects from stopping oil and gas pipelines to blocking mega dams has been on the rise worldwide. Young people have mobilized against the inaction of governments and farmers have rallied to po stop policies that favor polluting corporations. More than ever before, the center of gravity of the climate movement has shifted to a climate justice narrative where we do not distinguish between the global war on biodiversity waged by corporate greed and the wars waged against the cultures, cosmologies, communities, and bodies of oppressed people worldwide. A climate justice framework does not reduce the climate crisis to a puzzle simply focused on counting carbon. That's, this is an important point. Climate justice will never be achieved by what I call carbon reductionism. We have to expand the argument to all the points that Roger and Julian brought up. 
Grassroots community-led movements around the world look across the economy at the exploitation of land, labor, and living systems, at the erosion of seed, soil, and spirit, and seek to lift up real solutions around us every day, from indigenous traditional knowledge, food sovereignty, decommodification of land, healthcare, and housing, to the, abolish, the abolition of the military-industrial complex, seeking to extract the last dregs of fossil fuels from Mother Earth. From just transition and energy democracy, we're democratized, decentralized, detoxified, and decarbonized energy powers our lives to transformative justice, where we respond to violence and trauma with compassion and healing, not policing, not punishment and prisons. I'll, I'll leave it there because I think at the end of the day, if we are to fight and defeat the powers that are promoting high hydroelectricity as a false as a climate solution we need to get in we need to engage all those movements that are fall, uh, that are fighting police oppression fighting racism fighting the theft of indigenous lands and fighting you know the destruction of a mother earth as whole thank you thank you so much ananda that was incredibly inspiring and informative and it's really easy to get overwhelmed by all the techno speak and the different formulations of Green New Deals and carbon trading and net zero emissions and all of that. So um, I definitely urge people to check out the booklet and to learn about all these different ways that we're trying to finagle our way out of the climate crisis and often undermining the ability to have a livable planet in the future. So thank you. And I now we have time for a half an hour of questions. You can jump right in or put something in the chat or raise your hand. Questions? I'll I see Catherine has raised her hand there. Okay. But you need to unmute, Catherine. We can we can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, this may be a, a slight bit unrealistic, but has there ever been an example of one of these mega dams taken down? I'm going to say I don't know of one. How would you go about, or how would one culture, group, uh, organization, or whatever? I mean, it sounds like it would be a very difficult thing to accomplish but it sounds like it's absolutely necessary to not only stop future ones, but to start thinking about dismantling the existing ones. Um, right, I was, uh, they could go to uh, the flow, change the flow regulation, but then they wouldn't work because they need that uh, warm water in the, in the winter. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's that, that problem. Um, you know, they're just gonna have to realize the damage they're doing. Uh, isn't isn't worth it, and especially don't don't build any more. That would be my thought. But uh, I'll I'll look into that to see if any have been dismantled. I know some were destroy uh, self destructed. One in Russia, but I think they repaired it. Uh, but other than that, I don't know of any. I I would uh, I would suggest folks look into the undam the Klamath campaign. This was a campaign, and that actually it's I oftentimes use this as a case study for looking at how do you build movements powerful enough to take on these vested interests. And what was really brilliant about the campaign, it's like, you know, maybe 15 years old, uh, was that it took a coalition, a big coalition. It was led by some of the indigenous nations that live along the Klamath River, but it, uh, in, in coalition with farmers, ranchers, various rural stakeholders, small environmental groups, they formed a big enough coalition to actually force the utility company at that time to make a commitment to undam the climate. Uh, this, uh, I think it happened about eight or nine years ago. So I don't know what's happened since, but it's one of the most successful grassroots campaigns that's uh, instructive for anyone fighting mega hydro. Could you say the name of that again, Ananda? Uh, the, uh, the campaign was called Undam the Klamath, the Klamath River dams and it was the largest hydroelectricity project that was committed to being undammed, uh, I think in movement history. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. 
Um, sure. Can you hear me? I was yes. okay. Sure, go ahead. Um, yeah, there's a dam in Ethiopia that I think is interesting from the standpoint, or it's under construction uh, for the geopolitical ramifications between Ethiopia and Egypt. And I'm wondering to what extent anybody's got a deeper understanding of what's going on there because there's <laughs> obviously the Egyptians are not real pleased about this mega dam going up and uh, the Ethiopians of course are intent on going ahead with it. Any thoughts on that? And whether that's unique or whether we're also seeing those same, that same kind of potentially uh, overwhelming strife in other places based around mega dams. I'll say a few things. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with that, uh, that whole situation there, and it might be the first place on the planet where uh, a dam has actually created a war. Um, Egypt and Ethiopia are um, at uh, complete uh, a blockage of political negotiations. It's been going on for quite a while. I mean, the short version of the story is that you know, the Nile River <clears throat> um, provides not just um, uh, water, but also sustenance for the entire life of the country of Egypt. And, e and Ethiopia is building a dam upstream that will completely change the flow in the Nile, including take some water out of it. And that isn't to say that either Egypt or Ethiopia is responsible for this, but it might be the, uh, and Egypt is already like, threatened war over the dam. Um, and so <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's a situation that, you know, it's been going on for about a year, really solid now, where Egypt has been threatening war. Um, and Egypt, Egypt has a real war machine, uh, which you know, Ethiopia has less of. So it's a fascinating geopolitical struggle uh, on the Nile River there, of course, the um, birthplace of civilization, you might say. And it might be the birthplace of the first big war on the planet around water and dams. Great, thank you. Um, Anna has her hand up. Question is for Roger. So I was fascinating to hear um, your exposition on the Gulf of Lawrence and the impact of, uh, on the estuary there with so many layered impacts. and. It made me think of the Site C Dam and its impact many hundreds of miles downstream on the Peace Athabasca Delta, where it's not in like not so much saltwater estuary, but even before it gets there, it's the freshwater um, wetland that that is quite large and um, is now in danger of being dried up because it's perched basins, it's higher up basins, and they rely on the spring freshet to get watered. Uh, and if they don't get watered, then the vegetation will die. So I'm wondering if anybody in your in your talk, you didn't necessarily mention any carbon accounting that may have been done on the Gulf of Lawrence um, due to the change in um, the absence of the spring freshet and the change in um, in water levels. Are you aware of any carbon accounting for that type of impact uh, where a wetland can be dried because of the absence of spring freshet? Well, I have read that um, it's not the site. See, what's the, uh, the W.C. Bennett Dam? Is that the first big dam? First, yeah, yeah. Um, just from that on the Peace River, I, I read this, um, that 50% of the winter flow in the McKenzie is due to the releases of that dam. And maybe there's one other also. So they are losing some of the spring freshets. It's a long way from, uh, you know, the McKenzie outlet and maybe that area, but uh, it certainly has an impact. Uh, we, no, no one's really talking about it. I know the, there's something about uh, in some place in the Arctic, there's more rainfall now. And uh, it seems like in Canada, is there the same or less? Um, I, I seem to be different messaging about that. So, um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, carbon accounting. Well, the diatoms in the ocean, I mean, uh, 
I personally had experience talking to a, a oil coastal plain geologist and that, uh, you know, he, he couldn't understand. This was several, several decades ago, how, uh, you know, the, the fossil fuel burning would affect climate change because the diatoms through geologic history had always mediated climate change. And uh, so the, the only carbon counting experience I have is if you're, if you're messing with these diatoms that uh, are the about the only organism that permanently sequester carbon uh, in the ocean depths and is buried for millions of years, of course, it became oil, <laughs> you know, uh, later on, but uh, that's the only, uh, you know, how these uh, things affect uh, carbon accounting. But the, uh, all the other stuff people talked about, you know, there's a huge shift in, uh, in, uh, in, of course, methane and, you know, other forms of carbon being released. Uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, CDOM or, you know, the uh, dissolved organic matter is apparently increasing. And I don't know, I'm trying, we're really working on that, trying to find if that uh, has anything to do with these dams and all this stagnant water and uh, <clears throat> anaerobic, <laughs> you know, this of this of all this stagnation is affecting uh, the uh, this d d dissolved organic matter in the ocean, which is harming the uh, keeping the sun rays from uh, going so far deep. And you know, of course, you have less phytoplankton growth when you do that. So that's uh, there's a <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on this subject. Um, yeah, and I, I would like to make a quick comment. That that's a really excellent question. Um, because it brings up the issue of like, what are the life cycle emissions of hydropower? And when you talk about life cycle emissions, you're talking about the whole uh, process of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions. Like when you build the dam, when the you know, dam lasts 50 years, 100 years, you deconstruct the dam, but also um, how many wetlands it dries up. For example, on the Colorado River in the Southwest United States, it used to have a delta um, Colorado River has um, had uh, 15 or 5 trillion gallons of water in it roughly per year. Every single drop has been drained out and the entire Colorado River Delta no longer exists. It was 2 million acres of wetlands. And now it is a bone dry desert. And I've been there. It's a fascinating phenomenon to see. But um, when wetlands um, you know, dry up, they they release uh, uh, carbon dioxide into the air, and so these are absolutely part of the <clears throat> part of the life cycle emissions of of hydropower and dams that you hardly ever hear talked about. Is there anybody else that has a question? If you're um, on your phone, and you can also put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. It looks like Mark has another question. Yes, I'd like to bring up Site C in Northeastern British Columbia. I'm in BC. And um, we recently uh, were interviewing a, an Order of Canada winner who really brought that to our attention, the enormous sum of money that's going into this uh, dam. It's ballooned, it's up around $16 billion now. And what she pointed out was that it's, uh, we're going to be looking at a flooding 128 kilometers of really wonderful um, topsoil, basically. It's about 15 feet deep. It uh, runs east to west. It gets uh, 18 hours of sunshine a day during the summer. It's really hot. It'll grow just about anything. And I'm wondering about two things. One is the natural struggle between agricultural interests and mega dams, because that certainly seems to be, um, would seem to be a predictable outgrowth. And the, the second thing I'm interested in is whether there's a history of stopping a dam like this when it's been under construction for a number of years and billions have been spent. Um, because at least to me, it seems really like a very peculiar thing to be doing. Also, it's noted that if things couldn't be any worse, it's there, a big part of it is to electrify the fracking industry in that region of British Columbia, apparently. So I'm just wondering if they're about, in those two questions, um, the struggle between agricultural interests and these mega dams, and also the, um, the 
a history of stopping them uh, or does Big Mo basically see them to completion? I'm going to defer that to Gary or, or someone else, anyone else on the call. Yeah, I, I can't really answer that question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the struggle between river health and river protection and uh, growth and development, agricultural development in the Southwest United States too. Um, it certainly is a tension to say the least. You know, one point I did wanna add that would tie off of the, of the talk I, that I gave, um, the greenhouse gas emissions of site C have not been uh, calculated or estimated yet. Um, and that might be useful to the team there that is uh, challenging that construction project. Um, I have a team of scientists who can do that. Um, the, the calculations are actually fairly straightforward and the estimates are easy to, easy to do. And so um, um, Meg, maybe back here, you can um, stay in touch with me and you can put out a short white paper about that. Well, I have to say I'll be in touch because okay. um, that's, uh, that we would love to have that. I work with Extinction Rebellion TV. I'm also an author for, okay. that's Great. why I'm probing. Awesome. Catherine? Uh, thank you, Meg. Uh, many of you may know that right now in Washington, DC, this is at least for the United States, not necessarily Canada and the rest of the world, but very working very strenuously on definitions of what is clean electricity. Uh, we have the Earth Bill, which I'm working on. Regina's been working on that. And uh, a lot of us uh, are working toward moving us to this transition of our uh, energy system from a fossil fuel based to a, a renewable. And there is a lot of good work being done. Uh, and I just wanted to share that with you all. And I also am curious and interested in this idea of carbon counting the, green, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that it's not being done. Uh, this is one thing that upsets me a little bit as a person interested in the climate is, for example, with nuclear, the carbon is counted at the point of combustion. Now, every kind of energy takes, takes resources to construct it or build it or erect it, whatever it is. But for, no, for nuclear power, the fossil fuel usage from the mining to the transporting to the turning yellow cake into uh, spent uh, to fuel for the fuel rods and the whole thing is so extremely fossil fuel intensive. It's probably the most fossil fuel intensive of any form of energy. And I think it was Ananda who mentioned cradle to grave. And of course now we have 83,000 metric tons of nuclear waste we don't know what to do with. Uh, and we have people pushing these small nuclear reactors, which are actually portable bomb makers, uh, because the nuclear bomb, that's how we came across this nuclear energy, trying to make bombs. And oh, well, let's see if we can heat water with it and make energy. So the accounting and how nuclear is count or how carbon is counted to me is very, very faulty and part of this whole problem. And I, I, can, I can't even imagine the energy it must take to build one of these mega dams and the resources and the shortening amount of cement in the whole world is decreasing. And the use of, of resources, I mean, there, none of this ever comes into the accounting when people are looking at forms of energy that we can and should be using. So um, I knew there was a question <laughs> somewhere. I, I think I it's- comment. Okay. Uh, before I do this, so I'm just curious is about the, the, the greenhouse gas accounting that somebody mentioned. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments and I'll maybe kind of tee Ananda up for, uh, um, for him to educate us some more about neoliberalism and, and uh, politics in America. Um, you know, he called, Ananda mentioned the word cradle to grave. We also call it life cycle emissions. Right. And that is the construction of the dam, the destruction of the dam, all the wetlands that dries up, everything. Um, and you know these kinds of life cycle emissions need to be accounted for in every policy and in every pro proposed project. As an example, right now, um, and you mentioned the US Congress, the US Congress, uh, the, the Democrats in the US House put together a bill called the Clean Futures Act. Mm. And it is pro hydropower. 
Uh, it calls hydropower, it redefines hydropower by the federal government as, in, as a renewable energy and repeatedly talks about it. it has literally zero emissions. Wow. Now in, in really, really rare cases, a hydropower project might have zero daily emissions, but they all have, they all have life cycle emissions due to the massive amount of construction. Um, and so, you know, what you see, I mean, any kind of bill, and I don't, I don't mean to, you know, be, denigrate anybody who does lobbying at the, at, the government, at the federal level, but any kind of bill that actually gets to the level of, in the United States where it's in Congress, it usually is kind of a, what we call it, a neoliberal subsidy, uh, just um, train heading, heading for the, heading for the depot. And, um, um, you know, usually it's just like shifting the subsidies around. Um, and unfortunately, um, the big green environmental movement uh, tends to be on that train. Um, and it is not uh, an actual climate solution, nor is it um, a, a path forward that, that is real and is going to reduce emissions. So I teed you up there, Nanda, if you want to uh, give, us a, give us some more education. I don't know about education, but I, you know, I, uh, what I would say, yes, I, you did tee me up well, uh, because uh, the way I describe de neoliberalism when I talk to youth climate activists uh, is that neoliberalism really is the ideology that markets will self-regulate. That if we let the corporations destroying this planet, you know, uh, you know, make the right choices, they will figure out the sustainability equations themselves. And that's where the carbon accounting comes in, because the majority of carbon accounting that has been done over the past two decades at the IPCC has been carbon accounting to suit the intentions and goals of, uh, of the corporations destroying the planet. There have been, it's, a, it's, a, it's, all, it's a lot of false accounting and Meg knows this uh, uh, when we fought the biomass incinerators, it was for over a dozen years, we had even civil society groups like the Union of Concerned Scientists supporting the, bio, uh, the biogenic carbon accounting that the biomass burning industries were putting forward as fact. We were just accepting that, oh, the industries must be reporting all the right uh, stats when they weren't. They were lying about their emissions. It, it took a lot of effort on the part of a whole network similar to yours to expose the fact that biomass burners produced almost twice the amount of carbon emissions per, uh, per unit of electricity produced uh, than coal. Waste produces almost three times as much uh, when you burn it. So these are all false. We've had to fight that on fracking and LNG, and now you're going to have to fight it with hydro because this is where I will, from what I can see, even with the clean electricity standards that are being, uh, I was just on a call with some of the big greens the other day, right. and we're drawing the line in the sand. We're saying as far as the environmental justice movement, as far as indigenous people's movements and black and brown and poor people's movements, we're not going to uh, sign off on any uh, big green bill that promotes nuclear or biomass or hydroelectricity at this point in time. And we're kind of drawing the lines. And, and so I would suggest really strategy wise that you would, should consider two things. One, uh, who do you need to build power with? Who are the allies you need to seek out to support you in your fights against big hydro? It's oftentimes the people fighting fracking and other false solutions you know, in the same landscape. Like here in BC, I think folks fighting CGL should be strategizing together with folks fighting Site C. I mean, we all know the NDP government's kind of let all of us down on, on you know, multiple levels. That's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is who are, what are the, what are the, uh, the best, the low hanging fruit in the big green arena? Who, whom should we name and shame amongst the big environmental organizations? Oftentimes our friends like the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, well, not the Nature Conservancy, but the Sierra Club, the Union of Concerned Scientists, people who we can hold accountable to come over to our side. Any comments, thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, so much. That's so true. Um, um, yep. Yeah. Oops, Rita. Hi, yeah, Rita. I, uh, I um, I have a question for Mike. So, is uh, biomass not clean? Does it have gas emissions and stuff like that? It produces about 50% more greenhouse gas emissions than the dirtiest coal power plants in a nutshell. And there's, there's if you want more information, uh, I would suggest the Energy Justice Network has probably, you know, a fairly comprehensive, you know, all the research and data you need to, uh, 
to arm yourself to fight biomass proposals. Okay, thank you. Could I just have a quick response? Sure. Yeah. Okay, I just want to mention, Ananda, in full disclosure, I'm chair of Sierra Club New York City Group. <laughs> so I'm very, very involved with Sierra Club, but you must also know that Sierra Club is going through a massive structural assessment. The whole thing is changing. And we went through this whole thing about environmental justice and uh, Ramon Cruz, who grew up actually in Puerto Rico, uh, who was the president, uh, environmental justice is his big thing. So yeah, Sierra Club is one of the big greens. Yes, there are problems. They are sort of being addressed, uh, addressed. And I think it's very important what you have said. And I think it's sometimes hard for the public, the citizen who's trying to do good work to know who is, who is a safe big green? Who is actually doing good work? NRDC, is it, uh, you know, who is it? It's hard to sometimes actually know because we're all here on the ground or we're, we're all trying to fix, fix this climate thing, you know, and it's really hard to know sometimes. So true. So, I, oops, I do have a question, um, maybe for Gary or anyone. When we were thinking about the um, Conference of the Parties 26 with the IPCC, what is going on at the policy level with regard to hydro? Is there anything circulating that we need to pay attention to? Any greenhouse gas accounting? Any follow-up on what happened in 2016? Yeah, I, I alluded to this and um... I have bad news. Um, there was a hope a few years ago that the scientists involved with the IPCC who've been spearheading the issue around hydropower would start to break through and, and have more uh, impact. It appears that the hydropower industry has um, corrupted and infiltrated the process. And at this point, there's nothing positive to say. And I just got to say that Hydro Quebec is one of the leaders of that corrupt influence. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to people who are speaking off the record. Um, some friends of mine are climate scientists and know some people who are involved with the IPCC. Um, but I'm not optimistic at this point that you're going to see the breakthrough that is, is not just uh, needs to happen, but it's scientifically accurate. Um, the hydropower industry is extremely powerful politically, financially, you know, they own governments. Um, they have their hands into the you know, United States policy uh, on this issue. And uh, no one should think that this is anything but an uphill battle. Sorry to be a buzzkill. But that's no, that's good. quite all right. Um, yeah, and just to give people a little overview of kind of what's happening in New England um, we are, you know, trying to talk to um, regulators who count the carbon for our greenhouse gas inventories in Massachusetts, trying to point this out, that the corridors are being promoted as providing carbon-free or low-carbon electricity, but Hydro Quebec cannot substantiate any of those claims. The greenhouse gas inventories, for example, in Massachusetts, do not count any emissions from Hydro. We're trying to talk to the independent service operators of New England, which is the body that kind of oversees all of this. There's a lot of concern there about fugitive emissions from methane sources, um, but really nobody's looking at hydro. So there is a lot of work to do. Um, it is almost 8.30 and we have a few take action items. So if people are willing, we're gonna move on to those. Sure, thanks. Um, yes, we always like to end with some take actions. I'm sure there's lots of things that um, people could add and always at any point, if anybody wants to share any action alerts or things that we can do to help out your community or your cause, please uh, let us know and send them to us. A couple of things that we've been circulating are um, helping out the West Mobile Lake First Nation. Um, Chief Roland Wilkson was one of the speakers at our last webinar. There's a lot going on there, uh, fundraising in particular for their legal challenge, which I understand 
recently had somewhat of a victory. So there's that. And there's our petition to US leaders um, to reject Canadian hydropower imports. And the next slide is our sign on letter regarding Nalcor Energy's Gull Island Dam in Labrador. That will be the third dam on the Churchill River. One sixth of that electricity, uh, one sixth of Hydropobec's electricity comes from the Churchill River already. Gull Island will be built for export to the US. It's tied in with the plans for the Atlantic Loop Transmission Corridor. So that's a really important uh, campaign to keep our eyes on. And um, we've learned recently through our allies in Pema Chickamauk, Rita and others, that there are 10 new proposed dams in Manitoba. And we'll be looking more into that and trying to support our allies uh, the best we can. And finally, we have talked about legislation and um, what we can do both on the state and federal levels to keep our eyes on Green New Deals, clean energy portfolios, whatever the latest flavor of the month is in terms of a climate bill to make sure that those definitions exclude Canadian hydropower and mega dam hydropower. And then for the two corridors here in the East US that are requiring presidential permits to cross the border, that would be the corridor through Maine and um, Chippy in New York. They have already gotten their permits, but we can pressure uh, Washington to revoke them. Those are our take actions for tonight. And, and the uh, links are in the chat. Meg, can I say one more tiny thing? Sure. I want to take a second. Sure. Okay. Yes. I do want to say there, there, there are a few of us here on this call that we made a video and Meg helped us. We made a video, video about the dangers of mega dams. And we're hoping to send it to all the candidates here in New York City, including de Blasio and the per he's the person who could sign a PPA for Chippy. We're trying to prevent that. So we made a video that we're sending out, an educational video. And we also um, put this uh, through Sierra Club, we put a petition online to stop it. So uh, Sierra Club is doing some good things I must share with you. And some people here on this call have helped with that, including Meg and Gilbert. So I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that. No, thank you. We always want to take actions. That's what our Alliance is all about. Um, networking, connecting people and uh, building uh, the grassroots movement because we know the power has got to come from the bottom up. Thanks a lot, everyone. I, I did I, put links. Hi. I say I put links in the chat if anyone wants to quickly uh, grab them.